But today, one of the things that is remaining the same is we're continuing through the book of Nehemiah. I don't know how familiar you are with the book of Nehemiah. We've been in it for some weeks, and actually this next Sunday, we're going to be ending it. Um, but today, if you guys have a Bible with you, you can open up to Nehemiah chapter 12. We're going to start in verse 27. Um, and we will, when it comes time, we'll have that up on the screen. So, But we're going to be talking today about how, all about how we surround what we dedicate with praise. That's the concept today. Whether it's good or bad, we all have this tendency in our lives. We surround what we want to dedicate with praise. I got a date for you. February 2nd, 2014. Anybody know what happened on that day? What happened? We don't know? Like, what is so significant about that day? We won the Super Bowl. Yes! Yes! There is a true fan in here. Okay, if somebody would have asked me that, I wouldn't know what day it was. Uh, but, you know, a Super Bowl is coming up, and unfortunately, our Seahawks are not in it, right? Uh, but, but February 2nd, 2014 was a day that, that our, our state was changed forever. Uh, the Seattle Seahawks beat the Denver Broncos in Super Bowl 48. It was an incredible day. Like our, our first, and really, it, this is, it was our, like our only Super Bowl then, right? Right? We don't like to talk about that, but okay. Um, our, our only one, but our first one, hopefully we'll have more coming. Um, and even if you're not like a football fan, like I'm not, I'm not the greatest football fan. I'm not the biggest football fan. I can enjoy the game, and especially I enjoy the game with other people. But but even if you're not a football fan, on that particular day, you celebrated the win, right? Like there was just something that was so neat that we all got to share in. Our team won. Everybody was celebrating. Uh, Coach, Coach Pete Carroll said this. He said, everyone knows we are taking this trophy back to the 12th man. And you know that 12th man is all the fans, right? It was a win that was for everyone. Three days later, people came together in Seattle to celebrate the, the dedicating of the Lombardi Trophy to the fans. And there was this two-mile long parade, and they estimated over 700,000 people were there. O over, I have no idea, right? They all came to celebrate. And this is back when Seattle didn't know how to riot, right? Um, and so one of the things, one of the things that happened, like I don't know if you guys saw any of those hashtags, like like how how Seattle riots, you know, and like and like like somebody got real wild and got on top of a gazebo, and then it kind of got a little destroyed. And so for the next few days, they they rioted by like fundraising for to fix this, and um, and like people, they just it was said about Seattle, they're just so polite when they riot. One person's like, no. Go ahead and write it. No, 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 you write first. No, you write first. That was like one of the hashtags there too. And I read another one. I just went through them again because I remember when it was happening. It was just so hilarious, right? And, and I went through uh, some some old tweets, right? Uh, and, and it says, we're going to party until our Priuses run out of juice. Hashtag how Seattle writes, right? Anyway, I just thought it was funny. I had to work that in there somehow. So, um, but, but think about that number though. Over 700,000 people. I mean, Seattle Public Schools said that over 25% of their 51,000 students were absent that day, right? Uh, and, 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 and then they were, they were all at the parade, right? And then some teachers were actually no-shows as well. And I'm kind of thinking, well, how do you, how do you explain that? I'm, I'm sick today. I can't go to school. What's that ruckus in the background, right? <laughs> Nothing. Um, but on that day, you could feel the joy. Right? 700,000 people coming together with the purpose of celebrating together as this trophy was dedicated. And how did they do it? They did it with praise. They did. You know, uh, we've, been, we've been doing this since long before sports ever existed in our culture. I mean, it, really, when it comes to dedicating things, it goes way beyond sports. We dedicate a lot of things. And what I mean by dedicate is that we honor something, we, we, we take it and we set it aside, you know, for some specific thing. And, and to say, like, I'm going to put my focus, I'm going to put my attention on this, this one thing. In, in, within the church, we dedicate things. We offer things up to God. Like when, when my family purchased our home in Chelan Falls, 
we, we invited the whole church over on a Sunday, and a lot of people came over, and we just prayed throughout the whole house because it, frankly, needed it. Um, but, but essentially, what we were doing, though, is we were, we were dedicating this house to the Lord. We were acknowledging that it came to us through God's provision, and we're just giving it right back to Him, right? Um, each of my kids were, were dedicated to the Lord at a young age. Joshua, my, my youngest, which he's not in here, it's quiet. Um, <laughs> neither is my wife, so we're just going to think that they're together. Oh, no, you're there. There you are. Okay, sorry. Do we know where our son is? Yes. Oh. Okay. Just checking. Just checking. Sometimes our kids are a little bit more free range than we want. But, um, so, so, but, but Joshua is like dedicated right here. Right, right here. And there's a lot of you in this room that were here on that particular day. It was a special thing. Um, but we've gone through, what we, we have done throughout history is that when we choose to actually do that very active dedication, we surround the things with praise and adoration. Right? We don't just dedicate and say, yep, here he is, he's a boy. We surround it with, we surround it. Right? We surround that thing, whether it's a person or an object or something else, right? But but think about it. Okay, think about this. When 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 a couple is engaged and they decide to dedicate themselves in marriage, where they say, I'm dedicating myself to you, you're dedicating yourself to me, I'm no longer me, you're no longer you, we're gonna become one and we're gonna lose some aspects of that whole separateness, and we're gonna gain more aspects of this unified whole that looks more like Jesus and like the gospel. Right? In marriage, your worldview changes. And it's no longer a, a me and you, but it is, an, it is an us. It's a union. And when that dedication takes place, what happens? That, that was a question. I mean, what do you think happens when that dedication takes a, a wedding? <laughs> a wedding happens, right? That's what happens. A, a wedding, a celebration. People surround that bride and that groom as they become husband and wife. That's one of the things that we do. We dedicate when we dedicate, and, and then we surround them with praise. Like think about a, a building being dedicated. You've, you've seen those, right? Like a hospital or a school, some big deal like that. They have this big ribbon with those huge scissors. Which I, I kind of wonder where they get those. Is that like an Amazon thing or a Hobby Lobby thing? I don't know. But they're big and they're gold, and I kind of want a pair. I don't know why. But or, or think about like that groundbreaking ceremony where they take those photos of people in their hard hats pretending to dig with the gold shovel. You know, they're like they, they'll just kind of pose right there, and, and you know they're not going to actually do any physical labor. I mean, you you know that. Um, they're not gonna. There's there's no actual moving of dirt that's gonna be happening. It's just right. People people. Time right when you chose to take your health seriously, that one time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, I, I'm just speaking of me when it comes to diet. But um, when, when, when people decide to take care of themselves through exercise or a diet, and when they dedicate their body and, and invest time separating it from what they used to do, you know what happens, right? Like, you always have to tell people about your diet, right? You, you have to. I, I have never talked so much about food as I did when I was on the Whole30, right? Never. Okay, it just wasn't a, an occurrence to me other than like Reuben and Bacon, you know, and we talked about it all the time. But, but it never really occurred to me, but when I was on that diet, man, I couldn't stop talking about it. And it's not like, this is amazing, you should do it with me. It's more like, I'm dying, and I'm dying alone. You should join me in my suffering. Right? You, and really, you want people to join you so that you can have someone to celebrate with afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> we all do that in some way. Um, when we dedicate something, we always surround it with praise, whether good or bad. Whether it's a good thing to celebrate or not, we surround it with praise. The text that we're jumping into this morning is, it is in Nehemiah 12. And, and let me tell you, last week's passage was so beautiful. It was. This is another beautiful passage. 
See, the people of Israel are done rebuilding, they're done restoring, they're done doing all of this work. And, and Nehemiah, if you're not, not aware, is, is a book specifically about the story of the people of God rebuilding the wall that surrounded the city of Jerusalem. And it's finally done. And, and here in our passage, they do something that they have never done before in their history. They, they, they dedicate the wall. Right? And they dedicate this protective barrier of Jerusalem. So we're going to look at, at chapter 12, verses 27 through 30 is the kind of the first little portion that we're going to look at. And, uh, we'll see how far we get through without me talking, interrupting. But at the dedication of the wall, this is what it says, verse 27. At the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, the Levites were sought out from where they lived. Right? Now you may not know who Levites are, what Levites are. Levites were, were like the, the priestly part of God's family. Right? They were the priestly people. And, and as part of the tribe of Israel, their inheritance, it, it wasn't land like everyone else, but it was God. And their responsibility was to make things pure and holy and, and, and ready for God. And, and see, the, the, the Levites were never actually given possessions as far as land was concerned. The Old Testament says their inheritance wasn't land, but it was God. Which, I don't know, I've always been captivated by that thought. And what does that mean for us? Like in, in 1 Peter, Peter talks about how we are a royal priesthood. You know? Because I talk about our inheritance that, that we get. Some of the promises of those Levites are for us as well. But Nehemiah goes and he seeks out those Levites who, who didn't live inside the city itself. And he went where they lived. And then it continues and says this. Um, and, and, and were brought to Jerusalem to celebrate joyfully the dedication with songs of thanksgiving, with the music of cymbals, harps, and lyres, right? Lyres? 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 Okay, now I sound really smart after, after that, right? So, so, so we're talking drums, okay? Harps are like, like different, different, um, different lengths of string, right? Which would be more like a piano, right? And then the, the lyres were actually all the same length, which would be more like guitars, right? It's just a sophisticated lyre is what you're playing. <laughs> but anyway, um, the, verse 28, the musicians also were brought together from the region of Jerusalem. And, and I will try not to butcher these names, um, but it makes it really hard because, you know, I've, I've never come across somebody who's, who's named like some of these things. But um, so... From the villages of the Nodophalophites, I got it, from Beth Gilgal, and from the area of Geba and Asmaveth, from where the musicians had built villages for themselves around Jerusalem. In verse 30, when the priests and Levites had purified themselves ceremonially, ceremonially <laughs> they purified the people, the gates, and the wall. My brain is not working. It's, it's, it's the part where it communicates with my tongue. Um, that's the part. Good thing I don't need that today. Um, so, so here's what's been going on leading up to this important moment in Israelite history. And if you haven't been around the previous weeks, like, let, me, let me catch you up. About 70 years before this moment of celebration and dedication took place, the Israelites had a 9-11 event. They, as a people, had an opposing nation come in and destroy the very thing that they love the most. This group called the Babylonians, led by this guy named Nebuchadnezzar, showed up on the front door of Israel, and they destroyed everything that embodied the Israelite people. They destroyed their homes, their economy, their agriculture. The, the wall of the city itself was destroyed, leaving them vulnerable. The temple was destroyed, which, which meant that God's dwelling place was no longer with the people of God. I mean, they literally lost everything, and they were enslaved. Right? It, it was this horrible circumstance for the people of Israel. Everything they had lost. And, and, and many, many, many years later, by God's grace, they were able to come back from being exiled. And, and for 70 years, they started rebuilding. For 70 years... They, they, they rebuilt. This is what Ezra, the book of Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, Zechariah are all about. It's about the people of God starting with their homes, their villages, and, and eventually the city and the temple, and then the wall itself. And it took 
the people of Israel, 70 years to rebuild what was once destroyed. Can you imagine that? We all get frustrated with road construction, right? <laughs> right? We do. It, it, well, around here, maybe it's less road construction and it's more rock slides. If you really want to get to it, we have rock slides around here. And we're like, it's going to take how long? Imagine for the Israelites, the very things that, that was the embodiment of their own identity was destroyed. And, and it wasn't an easy fix for them. It, it took them an entire lifetime for them to rebuild what was ruined. An entire lifetime. Which, honestly... That's what it's like when you follow God. It takes an entire lifetime for God to do the renewing and redeeming and restoring. His work continues through your whole lifetime. There is no point when you are like, finally, I'm done. You know, uh, If you were to look in the mirror and say that, it would just reveal that God has more work to do. Really? Right? We don't do that. We don't look and say, finally, I'm done. I've been restored. See, that's not going to happen on this side of eternity. As you follow God, hear me, as you follow God, He is refining. He is redeeming. He is restoring. I mean, ask any of the older saints in the church, and they will tell you that they have not arrived in their faith. They are still in the rebuilding phase. I mean, imagine 70 years of that. Slowly but surely, they rebuilt. I mean, 70 years is a really long time. And at this point, we just don't read. What we just read is the moment when they're finally done. That's what we're reading about right here. And they're like, I, I can't believe it. It's finished. The city is done. And in that moment, they would have been reminded of Jeremiah 29, 11. You, you see, when they were in exile and they had absolutely nothing, there was this prophet, Jeremiah. He was this, this super old dude. Right? And, 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 and he didn't get exiled with everyone else. He stayed behind because Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians thought he was, he was too old to contribute to society. Right? We know that not to be true. So he stayed behind and he started writing these promises to the people of Israel, even though they didn't think they had anything left inside of them. Jeremiah 29 11 is one of them. Right? It, is a, it is a very famous verse. Right? We actually like to take it and make it all about ourselves, right? For I know the plans I have for you, not to harm you, but to prosper you, but to give you hope and a future. I mean, who wouldn't like that? To hear, the Lord is for me. And let me tell you, he is for you. But in this context, it's about a people who were exiled and enslaved and broken, and who thought that God would never come to their rescue again. But now, they're back in Jerusalem. And everything is restored. And, and they're going, God told us this would happen. His plans are for us. His plans are not to harm us, but to protect us, to give us hope and a future. That's what they're saying. They would see that. They were home. And for the first time, they felt safe. And a beautiful act that they had never done before. Actually, Nehemiah is the one who decides that they need to dedicate the walls of the city. And it's interesting. Because Nehemiah is supposed to be the governor, right? And, and Ezra is supposed to be the priest. And, and, and back in the day when the Israelites were still ruled by a king, the Israelites had a very bad false dichotomy. The rulers did ruler-governor things, and, and the priests did religious duty things, right? That sound familiar? Sound maybe kind of like America? I mean, you, you do the political thing, and, and we'll do the religious thing, and let's not blend the two. Don't infringe on my rights, and don't impute your views of religion and culture. Right? So there's this false dichotomy that, that says that there is sacred and there is secular. And what's incredible is that Nehemiah, not Ezra, Nehemiah, a political leader, goes to the Levites, whose boss is supposed to be Ezra, and he says, you need to dedicate the wall, you need to set apart the wall for something holy. Right? And now, this is actually kind of ridiculous if you think about it. Because the, the Levites knew what dedication was because they did it every single day. It's called that big, you know, interesting word, consecration. 
They would consecrate themselves to the Lord. They would consecrate the people of God during Passover or when they came in to give alms or, or, to, give, or, to, or to give offerings. They knew how to dedicate things. But what they always dedicated were the things that were supposed to have this holy purpose to it. Like, I'm not going to, like, I'm going to dedicate this piece of silverware that's going to be used in the temple because if it's defiled and it touches something that's not defiled and I eat it, I will become unholy. Right? That was the line of thought, which actually is untrue because Haggai challenges this and, is, and, 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 and Jesus actually destroys this concept and so does Paul. But they thought this, they were like, yeah, okay, we do that. We consecrate things. That's, that's what we do. But Nehemiah shows up and says, you know those ways that you make something separate and holy for God? I want you to do, do, to do that for something that you actually would deem is unholy. The wall. A thing that Gentiles would come and go through because of trade. Uh, a thing that has a dung gate, Right? Um, I want you to declare that this thing is now set apart for God. Right? This was an unprecedented thing happening in Israel's history. history. So, I mean, like, the question comes up to me is like, why, why does Nehemiah do that? Like, it's intriguing. Why, why would a, a governor usurp the authority of a priest and make the other priests basically consecrate or, or baptize, if you will, something that we would deem as unholy? It would be like me coming up to you as an accountant and saying, have you dedicated Microsoft Excel recently? Right? Have you dedicated your QuickBooks account? Or, or like doctors, have you dedicated the medicines you give to people? Right? Or, or have you dedicated those gloves that you wear for work? You, you'd be like, what are, you, what are you talking about? That's such an obscure thing. That's not a religious thing. Yeah. Exactly. See, Nehemiah knew that people were thinking that the wall was just a thing. And he's like, no, 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 This isn't just a thing. You dedicate a wall? Why? Why would you dedicate the wall? Their story. Because at one point in time, this wall crumbled to the ground. At one point in time, 100 years ago, before, before this, when Nebuchadnezzar showed up with the Babylonians and they destroyed the wall, Right? The, the, the reason why the wall was destroyed was, was not because the, the mortar wasn't strong enough. It wasn't because the bricks were, were weaker than the new ones. Right? Like, like Nehemiah has this new recipe that has so much mortar and more sand and all of a sudden it's going to be stronger. It's not anything like that. The reason why the wall was destroyed was because the Israelites chose to no longer see God as their protector. And then they learn that when they try to protect themselves, and nothing left. I mean, read the book of Isaiah, right? The, the Old Testament prophet book of Isaiah. The, the, the first 20 chapters are all about the prophet Isaiah living in Judea. And, and he's warning the people of Israel long before Nebuchadnezzar ever shows up. And he's telling them this. He's like, he's like if you keep worshiping the idols of foreign gods, eventually God is just going to open up your gates. And those foreign gods are going to come and destroy you. Those foreign nations will come. So please turn. He's saying repent. If you choose to not let God protect you, then he will just choose to let you have what you want. No protection. No safety. Your walls will not stand if you choose to turn from God. Which is how they got into this, right? Nehemiah knew that the wall was destroyed and it had been destroyed because of their own pride and their own arrogance. And in this moment, he's sitting there and he's thinking, we need to draw a line in the sand. That's what he's thinking. We need to draw a line in the sand. We can't think, well, if, 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 if God is inside the city, we'll, we'll be fine on the outside. He, he's saying, no, we, we need to set apart this perimeter, proving to God that, that even if we've got like eight feet, if we've got 20 feet, if we've got 30 feet walls, 30 foot high walls, we still need him. Not ourselves. We need to depend upon Him. Not place it in something lesser. See, He's acting like a priest. I mean, some commentators think, think that Nehemiah is doing something that Ezra should have done. 
And, and it's interesting because we don't hear from Ezra after this moment. But Nehemiah is the one who says, we need to set it apart. God can't just be in the temple. We need him everywhere in our lives. And so they start to dedicate. And, and the way they do it is, is really cool. The way that Nehemiah dedicates um, this. I mean, he, he doesn't just, just hit it with this holy water super soaker and say, okay, it's done. <coughs> it's not what they do. We're going to read uh, verses 31 through 39. And as we read this, some of it may be hard to understand just because of how it's kind of laid out, but I've got um, some images on the screen um, and even a map that I'll show people in Facebook land um, when that time comes to. But um, it's cool. So, so verse 31, this is Nehemiah speaking. He says, I had the leaders of Judah go up on top of the wall. He, he, he's saying, I, I, I had them walk up the steps to the very top of the wall. This, this is the very top of the wall that Tobias the Samaritan said, if a fox walks on, on their wall, it will crumble to the ground. You remember that earlier in Scripture? Right? I mean, all the irony of people who mock the people of God. God just loves to squash the irony of fools and, and religious people when they claim that God can't do something. See, Nehemiah says, I had leaders. Leaders go up on the wall. Not, not one, not two. I had it says, I had leaders of Judah go up on top of the wall. I also assigned two large choirs to give thanks. Like if, if you're thinking about like a, a huge choir, think hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of singers. I mean, it, it's bigger than, than any choir that you've probably ever seen in your life. Like this is a massive choir. Apparently back in the day, everybody could sing, right? <laughs> um, not anymore. It's okay. The Lord knows your heart. That was a joke. Reuben's laughing jokes off over there. I'm glad for that. Thank you, Reuben. You have beautiful voices. And believe me, I'm not one to talk. I, I can barely carry a tune in a bucket. So, uh, so he says this. He says, I, I also assigned two large choirs to give thanks. One was to proceed on top of the wall to the right toward the dumb gate. Hoshiah and half the leaders of Judah followed them. So, so you have the choir... You have the leaders of Jerusalem, and then you have half of these people. That's, that's hundreds, I mean, if not thousands of people that go. Then in verse 33, along with Azariah, Ezra, Meshelam, Judah, Benjamin, uh, Shemaiah, Jeremiah, as well as some priests with trumpets, and also Zechariah, son of Jonathan, the son of Shemaiah, the son of Mataniah, the son of Micah, Micaiah, the son of Zachar, the son of Asaph. And Asaph. Like that, that one's that one's important. If you, does that sound familiar? That name sound familiar to you from the Psalms? Have you ever read the Psalms of Asaph? Right? Where, where it says the songs of Asaph. There's like that, that little notation that's in there of the family of Asaph. See, they wrote this whole section. This family had this whole section in the book of Psalms. It means that chances are what these people sang were psalms that you can actually read. It, that's, that's really cool. I mean, look, look in, in your Bibles for the psalms of Asaph, or do a Google search. That'll probably get you there quicker, right? And, and you'll read psalms that say, God, you are our protector. God, you are our provider. God, you have rescued us from, uh, from, from brokenness. And all of that, it, it just bookends so well. When you, when you see and you can imagine them walking on top of this wall, right, that has been restored. It is so cool. Um, so you have Asaph. Then in verse 36, it says, And his associ associates, uh, Shemaiah, Azarel, Melalia, uh, Gilali, I'm, I'm screwing all this up, I know that, all right? May, Nathaniel, Judah, and then Hananiah, with musical instruments prescribed by David, the man of God. Ezra, the teacher of the law, led the procession. So Ezra is the one who's leading that first group, right? right? Choirs, trumpets, leaders, thousands of people. Then in verse 37, at the fountain gate, they continued directly up the steps of the city of David on the ascent to the wall and passed above the site of David's palace where the water gate with, to the water gate on the east. The second choir proceeded in the opposite direction. I followed them on top of the wall, together with half the people past the Tower of the Ovens on the broad wall, 
over the gate of Ephraim, the Jeshana gate, the fish gate, the tower of Hananel, and the tower of the hundred, as far as the sheep gate, at the gate of the guard, they stopped. So this is the description that we get. And Nehemiah, he he splits up this massive group to dedicate the wall. He has the Levites bring in the singers, the trumpets, everyone, and he splits them right down the middle. And, and, And can you imagine this huge crowd gathered? And then he has them begin to march. I told you I had some visuals to help. We got picture one, that first picture, Howard, you got that? Um, that's the very first one on there. It's the city of Jerusalem. That's the one. Look at that. That would be like Jerusalem. Uh, this is what the, the city of Jerusalem would have looked like at the time of Nehemiah. Right? This it isn't the original city. The original city would have been much bigger and beautiful. And, and this is actually why uh, the people wept when they first saw the temple being built because it just didn't compare. Um, but this would be um, Jerusalem in Nehemiah's day. And, and you can see the, the wall they built, right? I mean, you see that on the picture. Um, you can see how there were many people who, who lived on the outside of the wall there, too. The Levites, you know, they were called into the city. Um, so it kind of makes you wonder, though, like what the gates and, and what the city wall looks like. we got that next picture of, yeah, that's it right there. That's, that's a rendition of what it might look like. So, so maybe you assume that the wall was just high and, and thin like walls over houses. No, I mean, this thing was built to last. And Nehemiah says he took two different groups of people, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, and they walked up these steps, which, which the steps would have been like, like eight to nine feet wide, which means you're looking at a procession of hundreds of yards of humans all marching and singing, marching and singing things like how... How, oh, how good is our God. Blessed is the name of our protector and our provider who gives us songs of deliverance. And they're singing this over and over and over again. And then let's look at that next picture right there. Now, you may not be able to read that. That's okay. Um, But Nehemiah describes that both groups would have started at the Dungate. I actually, because... um, yeah, see, this is what you have on the screen right here, right? And the dung gate, let's see, right here on the far left, right right there. Because uh, you always wanted to know where the dung gate was, right? But from the moment I said dung gate, you're like, I got to know. It's right there, okay? Uh, that's where they started. Um, and and it's, it's that gate on the far right of the picture, the south end of the city. And he says he split them in two, and the first group led by Ezra would have gone on that top route, you know, the top route all the way around. Um, and, and, and then the second group with Nehemiah would have taken that lower route, that bottom route right there. And, and, you know, there's some differences in length there. I think maybe Ezra had shorter legs than Nehemiah, but, um, yeah, it took him a little bit longer to get there. And, and, and so they, they would have taken this multiple hour journey. Have you ever tried to leave a facility that is super crowded with people? Right? Some of you are you're probably like hyperventilating just thinking about it, right? Um, well, that's kind of how they would be walking. And, and, and let's just imagine something here, right? Imagine, here they are, they're, 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 they're doing that over the whole city, right? They're, they're walking over the, the whole perimeter of the city and they're singing these praises. Nehemiah says that, that thousands of people marched all the way around the city. And what if you're not a part of that crowd, though? What if you're, you're in the city? You're just working in the city, and perhaps you're poor, and you live by, by maybe the valley gate, right? And, 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 and there you are. And, and you live in some smaller quarters with some of your extended family, and, and, and you start hearing these songs being sung. And you look up, and you see this army of praise that's happening, Right? And you hear it coming from a ways off, and then it just kind of remains right there for some time as this mass of people just pass by. You know what I love about this? I absolutely love about this. What's amazing is that there's not one area in all of Jerusalem that does not get praised over. Not one area. 
We know for a fact that in certain areas of Jerusalem, of the city of Jerusalem, there, there were prostitution districts. That there were places of corruption. There, there were places where unspeakable things took place. And those places were not avoided in praise. The poor area, they got praised over. The sinful area, they got praised over. Because it was all being dedicated to God. And so they started making their way through, through, right? And Nehemiah says that they ended at the Sheep Gate, which is actually the opposite side, right? It's the complete opposite side right there. And, and there's a couple other references of what kind of happened there, but basically they get to the end of the wall itself, singing and praising and surrounding all this land with, with praise and adoration. Now think about this for a moment. This is so much greater and has so much more purpose than a victory parade for the Seahawks, right? I mean, these people are singing for a reason, not because they, they moved a football across the field, right? I mean, we get all excited about that. Moving a football field, football across the field, go sports, right? These people are singing for a reason. This is potentially 100,000 people singing, God is so faithful. And what we're standing on is his, not ours. Right? I mean, how beautiful is that? That's the way to dedicate something, surround it with praise, encapsulating every aspect of it in adoration to God. See, and they're not worshiping themselves or their accomplishments. They are worshiping God here. And it doesn't stop there. They don't just sing at the walls, right? They don't just sing on top of the walls. I, I love this. I, I, I love scripture. I, I'm, I'm a nerd in that way, I guess. But I, I love the Bible. It does what we might do in our most holy state, and then it goes further, leaving you in this place of just awe, showing I, I've got more to grow. I've got, I've got to be compelled to do more in my life. God wants to do more in me than just my version of holiness. Because if you look at the sheep gate where, where the end, you'll notice that the temple is right there. And the temple courts are right there. Once they arrive at the sheep gate, the Israelites go, the dedication is not done until I have encountered the God that we are dedicating this to. The work of God is not done in our lives until we have met him. You can do a lot of religious things. But if you haven't met the creator, the sustainer of life, then it's all going to fall apart. And the Israelites knew that. So verse 40, they finish the dedication by worshiping God in his temple. It says this, the two choirs that gave thanks then took their places in the house of God, right? They entered the temple courts, it would have been the temple courts. So did I, together with half the officials, as well as the priests like him, Messiah, Minimim, Micah, Micaiah, Elanai, Zechariah, Hananiah with their trumpets, also Messiah, Shemaiah, Eleazar, Uzziah, Jehonanan, Nakilja, Elam, and Ezra. The choirs sang under the direction of Ze Jezriah, and on that day they offered great sacrifices, rejoicing because God had given them great joy. Women and children also rejoiced. The sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard far away. The gates that were meant to protect them were unable to contain all the joy that they had because of what God had done. That is awesome. And, and this is what dedication is supposed to look like. This is what setting apart something for God is supposed to look like, surrounding it with praise to God, surrounding it with affirmation of who God is, and then finalizing it, not with the fulfillment of the dreams that you may think you have of that dedicated thing that you've given to God, but in admiration of God. Not the thing. Of God. Let me ask you this, and, and please just, just think about this. Has there ever been a moment in your life where you have dedicated something to God in this way? 
Has there ever been something of, of such beauty and value to you, something gifted to you by God, that you could not help but praise him and surround what you have been given with praise to God? Where the praise you're giving wasn't really about the thing, right? But it was about your longing and, and praise was about the, the presence of God. Has there ever been a moment in your life when that has happened? I mean, do we really worship God like that? I mean, a, a, a real act of dedication. I mean, sometimes our acts of dedication look more like us making plans and asking God to bless them. We conjure up our, our dreams or desires or things that we want because we think that God is always for what we want, not for our good, which sometimes our good is different than what we want, right? But we actually start pocketing all these things. And then what we do in our, in our moments of holiness is that we offer them back up to God. And, and, and what we are doing is not dedicating them to him, but we are, what we are doing is we're asking him to give us a stamp of approval on the very things that we want to dedicate it. It's not a thing that God has given us, but it's a thing that we've demanded of him, really. A dream, a solution, a job that we're hoping for. Like, God, if, if you can give me this job, oh, how I will praise you. Please don't ever start a prayer with God if, <laughs> right? Starting a conversation like that means that you're not willfully going to God saying, oh, how you have provided, oh, how I trust you, oh, I want to dedicate whatever you give to me, large or small. Really what we're doing is we're saying, God, I want you to bless this thing. My ideal spouse, my ideal job, my ideal marriage, that ideal family. We think that is holy dedication. And it's not. Holy dedication is you falling before God and, and saying, I don't even know if I'm worthy of anything. And everything you have given to me, I, I want to relinquish back to you with prayers and thanksgiving and, and adoration. Thank you for the home that I don't deserve. Thank you for the car that works. Thank you for the education that I have been given. Thank you for the family I have, the whatever I have. Thank you that I woke up this morning. I will dedicate my being to you. I will dedicate my sexuality to you. I will dedicate my weaknesses, my struggles, and, and I will relinquish that. I will dedicate all that I am to you. Have you ever done that? Or do you just hope and pray that God will just start blessing every single thing that you show him? As if like he's a genie. And if you actually think about that, if you actually think about those things, it starts piercing you because you start to realize just how selfish we can be. Like, oh, I don't, I don't dedicate to you, God. And then you start thinking about these Israelites. They surrounded what they loved with prayer and they relinquished it. And they praised God for it. And then you realize, oh, my goodness, that is exactly what God does for me. He's not demanding something of me that he hasn't done. It's actually something he, he's, he's done, and not only in Jesus Christ, but in something he's been doing for all eternity. I, I want... You guys open up to Psalm 32. If you have your Bibles. We should have it on the screen too. Maybe. Can't remember if I put that in. But, and, I, and I just want you to ask yourself this question this morning. If this psalm was true, if the words of it were true, why am I not dedicating everything I have to God? This is Psalm 32, verse 1. It says this It says, Blessed is one whose transgressions are forgiven whose sins are covered. All that shame and guilt and sin that you've ever lived with, blessed are you that God has wiped that away. It's gone. Verse 2, 
Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. You ever have those moments when you lie in bed and you think about all your regrets? You ever have that? Where you go, oh God, remember that one time when I did this and that one time when I did that? And God's like, no. Verse 3 says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. See, God is pressing in, is pressing in, trying to get this individual to just cry out because forgiveness and free is free and, and grace is abundant and God never runs out of either of them. So God is like, would you please repent and turn and call to me? Like that's the heaviness that's sitting on this individual. And the heaviness has purpose. It's to draw, to draw this individual, to draw us into a right relationship with God. It's not shame. It isn't. It isn't. It is conviction. And then it happens in verse 5. It says this, Then I acknowledge my sin to you, and did not cover up my iniquity. He said, I didn't hide anything from you. He said, I didn't try to justify it with excuses. He said, I, I quit fighting and running. Everything about my life was absolutely dedicated to you alone, God. He said, I'm just going to lay it bare. You see me. He continues, I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, bless you, because of all this goodness, therefore, therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble. And what does the wall do? It surrounds and protects. He says this, you, you will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. And if you believe this, if you actually believe that God was delivering you, that he was surrounding you, that he was lavishing forgiveness on you, that, that, that he was forgiving your sins, I mean, really forgiving them and releasing you from, the, from their guilt, that he was just insatiably passionate about you through Jesus on the cross, what would you do with all those things that you're holding on to? Would you let go? Would you dedicate your job to God? That thing that you do Monday through Friday. Would you dedicate your kids to the Lord? Would you dedicate your money? Would you dedicate your time? Would you dedicate your recreation? Would you dedicate your struggles that you have? I mean, even the ones you've been hiding from everyone because you think that you're just so unworthy. Would you just let it go if you knew that there was a God who was saying, I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to surround, I'm going to surround you with, a, with songs of deliverance. And that means like God is singing over you. You know who sings over other people? Parents. <laughs> Parents. I used to sing over my kids all the time when they were little. I even made up a song I'm not going to share with you. Don't ask. I asked my boys if they wanted me to sing them a song the other night. They said, no, thank you. Please. <laughs> Dang. Okay. Um, they have taste now. Um, but really, this is, this is a picture of what we do in baptism, too. This is a picture, really, of that word that we talk about holiness. It's where we make all of our lives available to God. Acknowledging God's love and grace and surrendering our lives. This is an act of dedication. This is an act of surrender. This is an act of consecration. This is an example that we have before us in Scripture. So many years ago. I am so thankful that the Lord can take the ruin and the rubble and restore. I am where I am.
And I just want to testify to you. He's amazing. He's not done with me. He's not done with you. So I'm going to ask you a question. And there's a reason why we've why we have the majority of our worship set list happening after the sermon. It's so that we can have some time to respond to the Spirit of God. So that we can have some time where, where we really can, can struggle with God if we need to, where we can make an expression to God, where we can surrender to God, where we can be led in those things. What do you need to dedicate to God today? What do you need to surround with praise today? That has nothing to do with you and everything to do with what God has given you. Today we're going to sing some praises. And as we're doing it, I want to encourage you to dedicate something to the Lord. And let me tell you, God did doesn't just want your stuff. I mean, we give God our stuff, but really our stuff is representative of us. He wants you. And he doesn't just want Sundays for like an hour and 15 minutes. Okay? He doesn't just want Sundays. He wants all of you beyond Sunday, everything. But the question is, will you relinquish it? I'm going to invite our worship team to come back up. Is that all right? And let me pray. And then we can let me just respond to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, I thank you for the example that you have given us today in Scripture. God, the great work that you have done. Lord, the destruction was great. You took a people that their whole lives were ruined. It was falling apart. They had no hope. And then you gave them reason to hope, Lord. That whole reason was you. It was your presence. It was that you have not forsaken them. You have not given up on them. Even in their disobedience, Lord, you called them to yourself. You made a way where there was not a way. So, Lord, wherever we are today, whatever it is that we're feeling God, I ask that your Holy Spirit would speak in, would breathe in hope and life. That we would recognize that, that brokenness is not the overarching narrative of our story, but hope is. But a God who doesn't just make good people better, but makes dead people live. God, you do that in us. So Lord, you have redeemed us. You have gone to great lengths for us. Would you help us to respond to you as a people who have been broken down but put back together? As a people who have been restored? As a people who, yet even though we still feel like we're unfinished, we have a God who is faithful. Lord, would you help us to respond to you today? And Lord, what I believe that you want from your people is you want us to be sold out completely to you. God, because until that moment where we are sold out for you and we continue to live that way, surrendered, God, we're always, we're always going to be for sale. So Lord, help us, lead us, guide us. We know we're unworthy, but thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name.